You guys ready for the exam? You're so funny, Dr. Brose. So, uh, today we're going to kind of worst case. Look at the world, looking at left side. Uh, to, to recursion, and recursions are just great to talk about again and again. I get all kinds of jokes. I'm really struggling with the, with the exam. I need, need some more problems to help me get ready for it. Do you have problems? So, yes, I have lots of problems. I teach math. So. Okay. All right. That's, that's <laughs> laughing on the inside. Stand up. Today. Someone just went to tell Matt, hey, I got enough problems on my own. I don't need any more. Okay. Oh, we're missing Zach. Oh, no, there's Zach. <laughs> hey, Zach, we should one of those lights right there. All right, so what I want to do is just kind of take a little bit of a step back and look at the look at the recursion again. And what I want to talk about is uh, uh, some patterns. And we see patterns in a lot of different places. How do I get rid of this? I don't think I can. Oh, well. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, so we see patterns in a, in a lot of different places. And we see in a game of Tetris, where you're looking at four blocks, Tetra, Tetris. Uh, you guys play Tetris with five blocks. You guys realize that? That's a really interesting game to do. <laughs> it's a lot more complicated. Uh, patterns in a Morse code. Uh, patterns in, in DNA, even patterns in nature, maybe electricity, how, how it's jumping around, and you know, see some kind of pattern there. there. There's patterns everywhere we look. And even in the chaos, we think things are so chaotic, there's actually patterns within the chaos. We just don't really understand the pattern all that well. Sometimes we just call it a little, we just say it's chaos, in which there, there is some kind of patterns there. So there is structure and order in things. Um, even we see things are chaotic. So even in your life, sometimes your life seems very chaotic. Uh, maybe God's putting you through some kind of test uh, to, to grow you in your faith. And it seems very chaotic and you don't really see what's going on. But there is a pattern there. there there is something going being played out behind the scenes. And one of my, I've got a lot of different Bible verses, but here's one right here. In the beginning, when God created the universe, the earth was formless and desolate. The raging uh, ocean that covered everything was engulfed in total darkness, and the Spirit of God was moving over the water, and the God commanded, let there be light, and the light appeared. And in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. From the beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. The Word was a source of life, and a life that brought light to people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. So even from the very beginning, uh, we, we see a lot of different patterns here. Uh, I'm not sure if you really realize this before. You take John and connect it to Genesis. It's almost like he's thinking about Genesis when writing the book of John. And right here, it talks about the word. It talks about in the beginning was logos, which we get the word for logic. And what really is math? Is it about computing values? No, not, not really. That's, that's called arithmetic. Math's about logic and reason, finding patterns. And you can really think of mathematics as really being the science of pattern recognition. And with that as science, you're really starting to see the forefront of that really kind of into focus. All right, so A naught. Uh, the first value here in our recursion, when we have a recursion <coughs> structure, we have to start off with some kind of C value. There it is, A naught. So a sequence again, 
a sequence is a discrete function whose domain is a set of, of integers. Now, it might be positive integers, it might be negative integers, uh, it might be all the different integers out there you think of, but it's a discrete function. So when I start talking about discrete functions, we talked a little about this back in calculus too. There are some things that uh, was great about discrete functions, uh, but some things that weren't so great about discrete functions, such as if you're a differential function, you must be continuous. So that would indicate that you can't take the derivative of a discrete function because it's not continuous. You need a continuity in order to go about taking that derivative. But as we talked about calculus, there's a workaround of how you go about that. Now, one type of sequence is known as the arithmetic sequence, how things are just progressing um, from one term to the next to the next. And here's a, an example of arithmetic sequence. Not too bad. So if you were to look at the spread of the numbers, it's going to be a nice pattern. So you go um, like you from one to three, three to five, five to seven. It has a difference of two, 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 two all the way down. And when you have that common difference, you're talking about a sequence known as an arithmetic sequence. There's also another sequence out there, the geometric sequence, and we see this in terms of the geometric series. And in geometric series, it's an understatement to say it's an important series. It, it's a very, very important series, and I'm still not giving it enough credit. That's how important it is. It pops up in a lot of different places. Uh, so the geometric sequence, if you look at the terms within the geometric series, it has this structure associated with it. And I can take it, I can rewrite it in a sequence notation. And as I go about my iterations, things will start being powered up. Now, I can definitely, I can kind of mix and match these around and get some really, really interesting sequences out there. And a sequence, again, is a discrete function. And it can help me pinpoint down uh, what's happening with differential equations, help me what's happening with, with functions. It can shed some insight that maybe sometimes a function is more complicated than C, so I take it to the analog of the discrete function to see what's being played out. Here's another one right here, the telescopic sequence. Uh, it's a really, really interesting sequence. Uh, so it turns the telescope out. And we talked about this in terms of maybe a telescopic series. And we developed a formula, if you recall back from Cal 2, of how you can actually sum these series up by looking at the internal structure of the sequence. Now, again, here I'm going to have initial values of A0 and A1. And I really need those values to get a sequence going. If I just say, here's a sequence, like, okay, what is it? Well, I didn't give you the initial values, so I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Is the first term zero, or is it one, or is it 10? I don't know. So I need that, that value. Otherwise, the initial value would be echoed throughout the whole entire problem. In a recursive sequence, the sequence which, whose, previous, whose terms were defined by uh, uh, previous terms, and there's different class, types of classifications. You have first order, and you'll have second order, you also have third order. You have first order linear recursive relationships, and you also have nonlinear first order uh, recursive relationships. There's a lot of different ways of how you could classify them. And if you're taking a class differential equation, you know there's a lot of different ways of how you can classify differential equations. A sequence, again, you can think about it as being a discrete analog of your differential equations, things that we saw last time on, on Friday, how you set those different equations uh, in explicit form. But for a first order, we're just talking about uh, one term in there, so one step away. Now, the second order, we're talking about two steps away. And the Fibonacci numbers, in, or Fibonacci recursion, falls right here in, in terms of the second order linear recursive relationships. Now, um, based upon which order you have, you can approach this one of way, one of one, one way, one of maybe another way. And another time you might see recursive sequence is in fact in terms of your series. This is one of the reasons why we do study this in calculus too. You see this, and you're like, who cares? Why would I even bother about this? But when I look at my series, it's a for loop. At least I can encode it in terms of a for loop. So here I have my initial values, and if you notice, there's S naught. Here's S2, S naught, S1. And I can contain this all the way down. Now, 
in terms of writing in terms of a for loop, I might say starting off s equals zero, and I can also do a while loop or a do while loop, however I want to initiate my loop, if I want to, uh, how I want to enact it, but maybe something like k would start off at zero, and I'll run up to a value of n, um, and then I'll have s equals s plus s sub k, but of course if it's pseudocode, I guess it's you need to write more like that. You would end it and then you return s to the user. And what this is, this is really nothing more than this. So by understanding the structure of the series, I understand the structure of the for loop. And if I can find an explicit form for the series, I don't have to run through the for loop. I can get my answer in almost instantaneous time. And if I had a for loop within a for loop, then looking at a quadratic uh, big O uh, runtime, and if I add another one in, looking at cubic, and my runtime and my algorithm, well, that's seriously bogging down the system. If I can bypass complexity, all those for loops, get to the exact answer, gives me the competitive edge against my competitors in the marketplace, which my program will run a whole lot faster, and I'll get better reviews, and I'll get more likes, and then maybe more purchases. Whereas my competitors may either doing it in terms of a for loop or do it recursively, and it's going a lot slower. So that's one of the reasons why we do want to look at these kind of things. Here's my recursive structure, by the way. Now, uh, if I was to telescope out, I'll plug in the first term, the next term, and then the next term. And things would fall down pretty quickly. Here I have my A1s, A2s, and so on and so forth. It all collapses. And then I would take my limit, some things that we've seen before. Now, probably something you haven't seen before is this. Well, I guess you know series this one first. Geometry series are telescopic series. I don't really tell people that in calculus two. Well, because I don't I'm not really ready for it yet, but they are telescopic series. And here's how I can set that up to reveal that telescopic nature behind it. I can combine my fractions, and I'm right back in here. So I would take it, I would re-express it, and here's another telescopic series. It's hard to see that it is telescopic. How would you set it up in terms of telescopic series? So it's going to be in terms of integration, in terms of integrals. And because there's a pi right there, that tells you you're probably talking about some kind of trig function of how you would uh, put things together. The integrals, I can also write these in terms of series. In a series again, it's a recursion. Okay, just kind of a nice little example. If I go from integer values 1 to n, I can use properties of integration, go from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, from 4, 4 to 5, all the way down to n minus 1 at the end. And if you notice, it's a summation. Because I'm adding them up, I can collapse it down to sigma notation. But what really is this? When I apply the fundamental thermic calculus to it, this thing, I have the telescopic feature there. Take it, plug it in, and look at that animation. It's like a a sub m plus one minus an a sub n. And if I take the limit, I have an improper interval. So this is connection between improper intervals and telescopic series that I don't show back in Cal 2, but once again, we have a hard enough time as it is just a series. Okay, so these things are in a lot of different places that you don't realize. Okay, so another real interesting sequence is the triangle numbers. We call them triangle numbers because we make triangles out of the numbers, triangle of one, and then you take the dot of one, you put Two dots under it, get another triangle, 
So you put three dots under it, you get the next triangle. It's just like we call them square numbers. We call them square numbers because we make squares out of them. I'm not sure that I'm taking it raising to the second power, but I'm making squares out of them. Okay, so we got square numbers, uh, Fibonacci numbers, and that's also another one. Now, to help us out, we've got a guest speaker today, Mario. All right, Mario, help us out. Okay, we've got the recursive sequence here, and I do have my closed form to get this thing rolling. But what does that really mean, Mario? I'm lost. Help me out. We have one, one, two, three, five, and eight. So in we go. And let's come out. One, one, three, five, and eight. And then, of course, 13, and so on and so forth. All right, so we've got our Fibonacci numbers here. Turn the page. He does fit this format of a linear recursive relationship. And whenever I hear the word linear relationship, linear system, we just see the matrix lurking around the corner. We can see the shadow on the floor, and we see it coming. So again, we can take this and we can reformat this in terms of a matrix equation, like we did last time on Friday. And I'll take my vector here, I'll iterate out get my n plus one vector, and that's my system. Okay, so let's take a little closer look at what this form is really saying. If n is equal to zero, if n is equal to one, two, and so on and so forth. What I can do is I can take it and I can feed it in. Here's my a1. I can drop it down here. I'll have a2 x0 equals x2. But wait one second. There's x2, there's x2, take it and feed it in. That tells me then I'll have a to the third power x0 and then a sub 3. And I can keep doing this over and over and over again. And I'm starting to see where this is going. I can look at this from an inductive standpoint. I have a pretty good idea. Now, to actually verify this, I might need to actually get proof by mathematical induction, strong induction, weak induction, how you want to approach it, but I will get something of this particular form. So that tells us then, it's really about powering up the matrix. I want to figure out what my values are going to be. And again, if I'm powering up the matrix, I probably want to diagonalize the matrix, if I can. can't always do that. And I can take it out from second order. I can also do third order. Okay, so here it is in terms of second order. There's it in terms of third order. I'll set my system just a slight variation to it. And what I get down here is my characteristic polynomial. Now, these matrices, these are known as convenient matrices, because I can very quickly deduce what the characteristic polynomial is. Look. One, alpha, beta, gamma. One, alpha, beta, gamma. And the signs are just going to flip. They're going to alternate. So if I can take this out to the, the nth degree, where I have my alphas and a's, here's my companion matrix. So I'll select the matrix again. And I can very quickly deduce what the characteristic polynomial is going to be. I can go through it by deflation argument. I can also note that I got my block. And here it is. And based upon it, if it's uh, even or odd, the last term would be positive or negative. 
And again, this term right here refers to the trace, the sum of the diagonal entries, the sum of the eigenvalues. That might be something you want to know for the exam on Wednesday. Uh, things about the trace, things about determinants, some characteristics associated with those. Okay, so how do we power up a matrix? What does it mean to power this thing up again? Looking at similarity transformation, and this goes back to the diagonalization we were talking about. As we power it up, remember A2, P inverse times P, drops down to the identity matrix, leaves me with D squared. Also for AQ, it's going to eventually leave me with DQ, so I have to take it and feed it in. Because an A squared, that's what that is, times an A, this is my AQ. And I can go through a nice inductive argument as well. I'm getting a pretty good idea of what's happening. Now, here, my characteristic polynomial again. The characteristic polynomial is the same as the characteristic polynomial for my diagonal matrix. And we did a proof on this last time. You think that might be a good proof to put on an exam? What do you say, Zach? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. I can also ask TC, what about the, uh, the eigenvalues, the spectrum? That might be a good proof right there as well. And how do I do that? I show they have the same characteristic polynomial. If they have the same characteristic polynomial, you're going to have the same roots, and roots are eigenvalues. So if they have the same eigenvalues, it's the same spectrum. Okay, so when I'm looking at my similarity transformation, sometimes I can definitely do my diagonalization. Sometimes I can't, and I got to do something called, or look at something called a Jordan block. In a Jordan block, that's kind of the best case scenario you're going to get in terms of a diagonalization. For diagonalization, you need algebraic multiplicities equal to G metric multiplicities. And that's also a really good true-false question to put on an exam. Or maybe you might need this to answer a question that talks about diagonalization. For Jordan blocks, yes, you could have all the algebraic multiplicities, equal to G mesh multiplicities, and that's going to take the Jordan block and it's going to press it down to a, a one by one block. But if you have some kind of eigenvalue whose G mesh multiplicity is not the same as algebraic multiplicity, you're going to get an interesting structure. So what's a Jordan block? I don't know. Oh, came from this guy, yes. Uh, Jordan, or Jordan, uh, a mathematician in the 1800s. He did a lot of interesting things in mathematics. And what we're really talking about, it's not this Jordan measure or curve, uh, really this normal form. And once again, I need some help here. So, Mario, what's a Jordan block? It's kind of a blockhead, look at that. No, Mario, that's not a, a block. Come on. It's always thinking about hidden blocks all the time. Hey, Mario, you better get running. All right, get out of there. So for these Jordan blocks, let's see. What really was a Jordan block? Oh. That's right, Mario. That's the structure of a Jordan block. Where you would have eigenvalues on the diagonal, ones on the upper diagonal, and then nothing there. But nothing means zero. Two examples. Well, they were size of a Jordan block. Now, if I'm taking my recursion, if I'm powering it up, 
Well, what does it mean to power something up? Oh, that's it. If I power it up, I'm going to get this structure. If I power it up again, I get that structure. So what happens if I keep powering this up more and more and more? You see something there, Andrew? One more time. What do you see? I see Pascal's triangle. I definitely see Pascal's triangle being played out. I hope you guys see that. We're talking about the binomial theorem. It's actually within this problem. Fascinating. And if I take it out to the nth degree, there is a binomial theorem which corresponds to Pascal's triangle. That's pretty interesting. It's also like taking the derivatives, isn't it? If I take the first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative. What happens when I take the derivative of x to the third power? Pull three out front, take one off. And then the next one, take two, pull it out front, three times two, which is going to be six. And then take one off the top. Let's go ahead and pause this though. And let's look a little closer at it. So once again, I, I do have my structure right here. That's my Jordan block. It's where I start powering things up. And it's not a diagonal matrix. How do I know it's not a diagonal matrix? The algebraic multiplicity does not equal the G-mesh multiplicity. In order for it to be diagonal, the G-mesh multiplicity is very equal to algebraic multiplicity, not for one eigenvalue, but for every single eigenvalue out there. What kind of matrix do I have? Upper triangle. Now, we're assuming that for a moment that lambda is not zero. How many variables do I have? Basic variables. One, two, three, four, five. And if I was to take lambda off the diagonal before I powered it up, how many basic variables would I have then? Four. One free variable. So I would say then the algebraic multiplicity is going to be five, but the G-mesh multiplicity is four. It's not diagonalized. Okay, so if I was to do some similar transformations, and if I had some kind of matrix, I might see this internal block structure. Right here, that would say the algebraic multiplicity is equal to G-mesh multiplicity. Right here, it would not. Algebraic multiplicity is 2, the g mesh multiplicity is 1. Algebraic multiplicity is 3, the g mesh multiplicity is 2. So it's not diagonalized, but this is the next best thing. And this is another similar transformation, um, Jordan canonical form. So once again, I got my recursion. I want to put this into explicit form. When I have something in explicit form, it means I'm telling you flat out, straight out, what it's going to be. If you give me a value for n, I give you the answer that fast. I'm not implying anything. I'm not making you read in between the lines. Implication, in between the lines, imply. I'm telling you flat out what it is. Now, another name for explicit form is closed form. And those are used interchangeably. In my closed form here, if it's a diagonal matrix, my eigenvalues are going to necessarily have to be, well, not necessarily, yes, but uh, they're definitely going to have a lambda and a mu up here. And if they are uh, identical, we'll have a slight variation. We're going to perturb the answer ever so slightly and put it in the front. Why do I put it in the front? It all goes back to the Jordan blocks. Now, when we look at the third order, here are three different cases. All the eigenvalues are different. Two are different. One's the same. Or they're all the same. If they're all the same, you have C0, C1n, and then C2n squared. Now, hopefully, you're starting to see the pattern. If I had a four by four, and if I looked at a fourth order linear recursive relationship, and if all the eigenvalues are the same, well, it's not going to be diagonalizable. We're going to have some issues there. But 
the closed form would be C naught plus C one n plus uh, C two n squared plus C three into the third power. So the roots of the characteristic polynomial again correspond to this recursive relationship. And that has to do with one count the matrix. So if I go back to the two by two case, and you know, I can see what the characteristic polynomial is going to be because I have my alpha and my beta. I go back to the, uh, the companion matrix. And if I use the quadratic formula, this is what I'm going to get each and every single time. So it tells me a little bit more about when I'm going to have unique roots or when my roots are going to be repeated as to which case am I going to follow. It's all based upon what happens here with the discriminant. If my discriminant, if it's not zero, then my roots are unique. That's my structure. If my discriminant is zero, it all passes down to repeated roots, then that's my answer in its uh, entirety. And if you know alpha and beta, I just found myself a really, really nice formula of how to get to the end very quickly. Okay. Let's look at this case right here. Uh, if lambda is not equal to mu, so we have distinct roots, I can set up my system. And if I plug in zero, and the reason why I'm going to plug in zero is because I, I got to figure out, I got two variables here, C naught and C one. So I apply, in other words, the initial condition, those C values, A naught and A one. And note that I have a linear system. Lambda to zero, one. U to zero is also one. So the first equation just boils down to C naught, C one, A naught. Second equation, I plug in equals one, A one. Lambda to the first, U to the first, collapses down. Do a little bit of row operations. And right here, I find out. By doing a little bit of an abstraction, just looking at it from an arbitrary standpoint, I got myself a nice formula now for C0 and C1. Luckily, those two are not the same. <laughs> We're in trouble. Maybe world A trouble. Okay. So here's my closed form whenever lambda and mu are distinct. And I plug in the C0 and C1. And lambda again, mu, if they're distinct, one's positive, one's minus. I can take it, I can plug them in, lambda and mu. Combine them. Plug them in. Maybe simplify down a little bit. What about these Fibonacci numbers? Because upstairs, we're trying to make you program this. <laughs> My computer keeps crashing. I try to get to the 100 Fibonacci number. I couldn't even get past the 10th one. I kept putting it on top, put it on top of the stack, kind of pop it off. So instead of the Mario Brothers, you have the Philly Nutsch numbers. Here's my structure again. Alpha and beta are both one. Mario, Alpha and beta are both one. Oh, he's a little slow there. Come on. So there's the eigenvalues for the characteristic polynomial associated with the Fibonacci numbers. One minus lambda, or one minus mu is lambda. Well, that's an interesting relationship. Oh, hey, thanks. All right, yeah, here. So, root five. That's pretty cool. So, I can start taking these values, start plugging them in, and I see a really interesting correlation here. And what I just said was the closed form with the Fibonacci numbers. 
And so they're trying to make me program this, but I know the secrets. I know what Lambda is, what Mu is. I can take it and plug it in. And although technically it's not instantaneous runtime, this is about as close as I'm going to get. I do have this exponent guy to deal with. But at least I'm not recursively going through every single number to get the number I need. I can just skip the number that I want. Do a little bit of simplification. And if I was to plug this into a calculator, I would see I would start getting zero. Plug in zero for n, I'll get one, then one, then two, and then so on and so forth. And that's exciting. Hooray, hurrah. Oh. Sorry, Mario. He came so far, didn't he? Just a little bit. So, how do we find the closed form? It's all based on that structure. And the reason why you get that n or the n square is all based upon the, the Jordan Knopf form as you pick things up. Kind of leave off to us. <laughs> One day I see will arise and use the power of the matrix to light our darkest out. The power of the matrices. Linear algebra kind of sometimes is kind of like underrated. Bachmann's prime likes it. That's a prime example. I hope that today's lesson was a positive and an encouraging learning experience, and that you have a better understanding of how to solve these problems. Be sure to set some time there today and throughout the week to review these concepts, to rework these examples, so that you're better prepared for the next lesson. If you need anything, just let me know. You're always welcome to send me an email or to stop by during office hours. Until next time, keep up the good work and have a great day.